Rub up your engines. Sylvia Frank says, I'd like Scotty's opinion on these motorists who install super loud railway horns in their vehicles and cause drivers to freak out and almost die of a heart attack when they're sounded. When I was a kid, I was one of those guys. <laughs> I had an Opal. And then this little beep beep horn, right? So I went out and got one of those big old electric air horns. The Opal didn't have much electricity power in it, but it was a deal where it had a electric motor that powered an air compressor, then the air compressor ran the railway horn. And I had a laugh with that. One time some guy cut me off in a giant pickup truck and he heard that noise, he looked and he sees this little bitty opal behind him. I thought it was kind of funny, but it can get dangerous. And if this is Texas where I live, a lot of guys have 45s in the glove box and if you try to freak them out, they might start shooting back. So you might think twice about using it here in Texas. Parecki, Scotty, when will oil run out? Well, you know, they're always saying, uh, we've reached peak oil, we passed it, but then they do all this fracking and find out there's a whole bunch more oil left. I have no idea when we're going to run out of oil. There seems to be an awful lot of it out there. And of course, we can create it now. They can get bacteria and create gasoline and oil if they want. So I doubt we'll ever actually run out of oil. It can always be created now. We can actually make the stuff if we want to. The point is, do we really want to do that? Is it economically feasible? Would it be better to just generate electricity and have electric cars? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff out there. Since they can actually make it with microbes and stuff now, if they mass produce that, we could produce it if we really wanted to. So I don't think we'll ever run out of oil. Bob Collins says, E15 gas, 15% alcohol, good or bad? Okay, we're probably going to be going to that. And we're probably going to be going to that because Trump wants to save face with the farmers and sell a lot of corn. They'll be happy because they'll be making more money. Now, most of the gas is E10. If you go to the pump, it says may contain 10% ethanol. That means it does. Now, they're trying to bump it up to 15%. It's, it's a political bandwagon there. I don't know if that's going to harm the engines or not harm the engines because I never ran this stuff. And my cost Customers never ran. I got customers that run the E85, 85% ethanol, but that is run in the cars that are made to run on it. Those are the cars with the little stickers on the back, but you have to have a car designed for that. And even those have had some problems. So I'm hoping it doesn't damage stuff. If they do start selling it in mass, it'll be more a political thing for Trump to make the farmers happy that they're going to sell a lot more corn to make alcohol out of it. It's more than anything else. Robert Rivera says, Scotty, when are self-driving cars going to be the norm? Probably not for quite some time because as everyone that has a brain in their head and understands people and computers, the only way that can really happen and not create a gigantic mess is when everybody has self-driving cars or two lanes that are blocked off that are for self-driving cars and the other two lanes that are blocked off for only cars that people drive themselves because you can't mix people and computers. I'll give you a perfect example. There are even cars out there today that have adaptive cruise control. So you set it at 60 and it'll say, okay, at 60 you have to be six car lengths behind the nearest car. So it'll set it. So if a car gets in front and it's not six, it'll slow down till it's six behind. Imagine that with self-driving cars and people that are driving. As soon as there's those six car lengths, people will be pulling in front of you that are driving their own cars. <laughs> but if they were all self-driving cars, they would all stay six car lengths behind. I don't think it's going to be for quite some time because I can't see the United States government putting money into the infrastructure that all the roads are going to have to be part set up only for self-driving cars and part for people driving cars. And I don't see that infrastructure being paid for anytime soon by anybody. Carlos Barco says, Scotty, is it possible on a BMW with only 56,000 miles to have a transmission leak? Well, it's not only possible, it's probable. A lot of them, I see it all the time. Now, they don't make those things like they used to, and they just don't hold up, and they cost money and money and money. And a lot of times, the maintenance isn't done right. Here's a story, and this is a true story. I had a customer, she was a lawyer. She had a BMW. She bought a new one, and for four years, it was under warranty, whatever that means. She had paid for having it maintained to the BMW dealer. Well, after it was out of warranty, she brought it to me and it had 80,000 miles. And she said, change the transmission fluid. So I opened it up and the transmission fluid came out like molasses. And I said, oh, 
no one's ever changed the fluid. And she showed me four receipts for fluid changes. They hadn't touched, they hadn't done a thing on that car. And then a while later it went out. Crazily enough, she bought another BMW. I would have thought she would have been mad. She was a lawyer, you think she would have sued BMW? She just went out and bought another one after they had ripped her off for four changes and they'd never done anything because the only way that stuff can get thick as molasses is 80,000 miles of never changing it. And supposedly they changed it four times. Uh, so, I mean, I don't trust those people. I just have experiences with them and I wouldn't trust them and it doesn't shock me that it's leaking with that small amount of mileage. David Murphy says I got a 2002 Honda Odyssey van. It runs rich and has 133,000 miles. Okay, you run rich for one of two reasons. Either you got too much fuel running into it or you have a restriction on the air. Pray it's something simple like your air filter is clogged up and that can do it. Or there's a plastic bag stuck in the intake somewhere. Check that. Now the other reasons are the MAF sensor's gone bad or you got a leak in the fuel injection system. So have a mechanic put a scan tool on, analyze the MAF data, the mass airflow sensor data to see if it's within specs. If it's that, just buy another one, simple thing. If it's not, it's got a leak somewhere, then you got to start pinpointing it. Is there an injector, is it a pressure regulator? It can get complex then, but pray you got a dirty air filter, some clogged up in the intake. I've seen it happen. Big Jim says, hey Scotty, I got a 2011 Toyota Tundra. I'm thinking about putting a supercharger in there. It's 100,000 miles. What do you think? Well, the Tundras, most of them have big V8 engines. So you generally have enough power. If you want more power, a supercharger is a good way to put it in. But realize, superchargers just ram air into the engine. If you do it with a motor that's got 100,000 miles on it, sometimes it will wear them out faster. Now, that's a pretty well built engine. You want to give it a try. Just realize if you do, and then later you got to rebuild your engine, you got to rebuild your engine because you put the supercharger that puts a bigger strain on the motor. But if you do want power, superchargers are the easiest way to add them in because you don't have to mess with the exhaust. Scott Delamore says, Scotty, I got no for Honda Civic, 100,000 miles. Warm air under moderate to heavy acceleration when driving 40. Otherwise, it blows cold and both cooling fans work. You might do a little research, get your VIN number. A lot of those fancier Civics had an ecosystem on them so that when you're accelerating, to get more acceleration, it shuts the air conditioning compressor off. Your car may just be built that way. I've seen them like that. Now, if it isn't, it generally means that the AC compressor is getting a little weak, and as you accelerate, it can't compensate. But once you get to a certain speed, then it stays spinning at a higher speed and it blows cold. But a lot of those, they were set up in an eco mode that they do that. They were made that way so that you get better acceleration when you want to accelerate. And then when you're just cruising, the compressor comes back on. Bronson Pincho, my ABS brake service light is on. When your ABS service light comes on, that means your computer system has found a problem with the anti-lock brake system. In most vehicles, the ABS system is a fail-safe system. So if something goes wrong with the anti-lock brake systems, it turns that light on, it'll turn the anti-lock brake system off and you'll have normal non-ABS brakes. Now, if you want to figure out what the problem is, unfortunately, there are some ways by pushing buttons and doing tests, occasionally you can get the codes, but the only real way to work on them is with a high-level scan tool. Now, I have found some and I made videos on it that for a couple hundred bucks you can buy a scan tool that can read certain ABS codes but to work on them they're so complex that you got to get the codes but you also have to have a scan tool that can do bi-directional testing where you can check a solenoid turn it on with the scan tool see if it's turned on and off they're very complicated stuff so if you do have a system and the lights on it means you have a problem and if you want to see what it is you best to be a mechanic to check it out I got a lot of customers that when they find out that oh the ABS brake module is bad and it's going to be $1,800 they say well what should we do and I said well if you don't mind living with non ABS normal brakes just live with it and a lot of them do live with it they don't want to spend that kind of money, but you got to have a pro check it out first to see what's really wrong. You can't just guess. Daniel Kashigwa says, Scotty, my brother has a 2011 Nissan Altima. The power steering fluid is bubbling when the car is turned on. What's the problem? Yeah, if you take off that top and it's bubbling inside, it's one of two problems. Either you got an air leak on the return side and it's sucking some air and that makes bubbles, or more often, the pump itself is going out and it just foams up because the thing is wearing out and it doesn't work right. Now rarely, but it could happen is your high sideline or the power steering rack is getting clogged up inside. The pump pumps the high pressure that direction and if it is stopped up, it can feed back into the pump. That's more rare though, but it can happen.
So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.